All right, so um, yes, I want to talk about some joint work with uh, Rob Morris. Um, and the, so the basic question that Rob Morris and I were interested in looking at was questions of the following type. So what you want to know is how many sets are there? How many sets, A? And you can ask this question in various different contexts. So you might ask in the interval 1 up to n is one example we're interested in or other settings, or in Z modulo NZ, or vector space over finite field, etc. <coughs> so choose your favorite setting. How many sets A are there with a certain specified size? The size of A is K. And um, whose sum set also has a, a specified size. And the size of the sum set, A plus A, um, is so there's a huge number of questions here, depending on what the group is and what the relative sizes of k and m are. But this is the basic type of question we're interested in looking at. Um, OK. So well, maybe I'll tell you one of our results about this before I launch into some so-called applications. So let's think of just, just about this setting here. So let's think about subsets of the first L integers. Um, so what about sets A contained inside 1 up to N? So what's the possible range of values of M? So fairly trivially, um, M has always got to be between 2K minus 1. That's the smallest it can be. And uh, k choose 2, maybe plus k. A half k, k plus 1. So somehow, as anyone who's done some additive combinatorics would be familiar with, the lower end of this spectrum here is where a is extremely structured. Equality only occurs. This is a, a 2, yes. Sorry. Um, the lower end of the spectrum here is where A is very structured. It's an arithmetic progression. And the upper end is where A is some highly unstructured, sort of random-like set. So most of the new work that Rob Morris and I did on this question had to do with this end of the, um, of the spectrum here. So let me fix. Let's fix a value of k, big K. And, um, and ask how many a contained in 1 up to n have size k, little k, and the size of their sum set is less than big K times little k. You have to choose the same letter. Yeah, it's annoying, isn't it? But um, I can, <laughs> I think my. I think you can tell you can tell between them. So somehow we should also think of big K as being smaller than little K. Yeah. <laughs> so let's think of K as being, I don't know, fixed as say ten or something. It used to be the case that this this is the doubling constant. It, it, it's pretty much always called big K. That's why we had to use big K here. I guess I could have chosen something other than little K here. <laughs> but um, it used to be a decade or so ago, this used to be called C. But now C is just an, I mean, I think C has always just been an arbitrary constant, which can vary. So, so, so. You should use for A also big. <laughs> 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 That's a good idea, actually. Oh. Un <laughs> Blackboard bold K, perhaps. <laughs> but then what field am I working over? Anyway, <laughs> hopefully there isn't too much genuine danger of confusion here. So I've got a fixed value of the doubling constant, and I want to know how many subsets of 1 up to n there are which double by at most that amount. So what about some lower bounds for this? So can I construct at least um, a fairly big collection of, of sets with this, uh, with this property? 
Well, there are two different ways that I want to show you of constructing sets with doubling constants at most k. So <coughs> construction one. Um, one thing you could do is just take an arithmetic progression of length that p contained in 1 up to n be any arithmetic progression. Um, of length big K times little k over 2. And then however you choose A inside there, so let A contained in P be arbitrary, set of size little k, then because A plus A is contained in P plus P, I certainly have A plus A is at most the size of P plus P, which is basically big K times little k. So any set like that will, be, um, will have this property that it has size k and its doubling is at most big K. So this gives, well, basically big K times little k over 2, choose k sets. So that's one type of construction. A second type of construction is I could take A to B just an arithmetic progression. Um, P. Yeah, so I'll, let me elaborate upon that in just a moment. There are n, roughly n squared different ways of choosing p. Uh, so let a be some arithmetic progression um, together with union just a few extra elements. So x1 up to x sub k minus 2 or something like that, big k minus 2, where the xi are arbitrary. So you can just you can convince yourself that if you add this set to itself, what you basically get is p doubled in length, together with k minus two translates of p, and then a, a few extra points. But roughly speaking, the doubling of this set is also at most big k. Slightly roughly, um, a plus a has size at most big k times the size of a. So how many ways are there of choosing a set like this? Well, this is more related to what Avi said. I can choose the progression p in about n squared different ways, choose the base point and the common difference, and then I can also choose those points in about n different ways, um, and each of them in about n different ways. So this gives, uh, again, roughly, because I need to, I might have accidentally chosen a set that sort of pushes outside of the interval 1 up to n or something, but roughly, n to the big K Choices of A. OK. So, well, the main theorem of Rob Morris and I on this problem of counting some sets is that, roughly speaking, these two examples give you all of the, um, in some sense, account for essentially all of the sets A with this property. But maybe something additionally that I'll point out is that somehow one of these wins, so this construction wins if uh, little k is bigger than log n, because you get exponential in k things here. And this construction wins in the regime that k is little o of log n. So the theorem, a theorem of Rob Morris and myself, is that the number sets A 
in 1.2n with size little k and doubling constant big K at most big K is roughly the product of these two um, functions. So it's roughly big K little k over 2, choose k, times n to the big K. And I'm going to, I, I won't say precisely what I mean by roughly. So it's, um, as long as you're not in the critical range where these two constructions somewhat overlap, um, this is asymptotically correct if you take the log. But so, so somehow, the idea is that this is a pretty decent estimation of the, um, of the number of, of sets A with this property. And there is a precise statement in our paper that you could look up if you so feel so inclined. It's multiplied or added? Uh, multi it's multiplied. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing is that, um, so I guess the roughly means an asymptotic of the log. And um, outside of this, so for most values of k, unless k is comparable to log n, one of these two terms massively dominates the other. Yeah. So it doesn't. Plus would have been the same. Yeah. Um, but actually, the way the proof goes, it's more natural to write times. So that's the basic idea. So why would we, well, I mean, I guess we're really interested in this for its own sake, but I want to tell you some applications of this. So the first application has to do with a topic that I started studying when I was doing my PhD, and um, it's to do with random Cayley graphs. So I, I got interested in this because, I mean, probably most people here know about Ramsey's theorem and the fact that you can get a, a two-coloring of, um, of a graph on n vertices with no large clique or no large red or blue clique by taking a random coloring. And everybody thinks that such things as the quadratic residue graph, where you take vertex set z mod p and join x to y if x plus y is a quadratic residue, should be a good Ramsey graph. I'll say some more about that particular example a bit later. Uh, it seems to be completely hopeless to prove any statement like that. Uh, in fact, we can't really show that it has no clique size larger than about square root of p. But what I wondered was whether at least that type of construction should be able to give you a good Ramsey graph. So the question is, so can Cayley graphs be good Ramsey graphs. So more specifically, let's consider constructions of the following type. So for A in uh, Z modulo NZ, form a graph G of A. Um, on vertex set Z mod NZ. By joining X to Y, if and only if X plus Y lies in A. Now, this is not quite the usual definition of Cayley graph. I, could, I suppose I should really call this a Cayley sum graph. For the purposes of everything I'm going to say today, um, it would also work for Cayley graphs, but in that case, to make the graph well-defined, you have to assume that A is symmetric, and it just becomes a bit notationally annoying. So this is a perfectly valid construction of, um, of a graph from a set. So e.g., a common construction, um, n prime, A is the quadratic residues. Modulo n. So the question is, can you choose A so that G A has no large clique or independent set?
Um, and perhaps also, I mean, I'm going to talk about this question for random sets A. This should perhaps also give you some intuition about what you would expect for the, um, for the quadratic residue graph. There's actually been various things written in the literature about what one might expect for the quadratic residue graph. And some of those things, I think, are wrong. So I think it basically does behave like a random graph. I'll try and justify that in a bit. So the, question, the theorem that I proved in my thesis about this was that so if you pick A randomly, so select, suppose N is prime, um, and select A in Z mod NZ at random. Uh, then almost surely, as n tends to infinity, the clique number of this Cayley graph, clique number of g a, is at least bounded by a constant times the log of n. Um, and Rob Morris and I have updated this. Bob Morris and myself, 2013, can now get the, we can get the tight asymptotic for this. So it's actually 2 plus epsilon. For any epsilon greater than 0, this is basically, this is the most 2 plus epsilon times log 2n. So same as for a genuinely random graph. Sorry? Is it, could it be that Cayley graphs are better than random graphs? No, it is tied, yeah. It's, um, so equals plus little o1. Yeah. In fact, the lower bound is pretty easy, actually. Um, one thing I should remark about this is, uh, although I won't say much more about this point, but this question is quite delicate as regards which group you choose. So something I showed 10 years ago is that if you do the same construction, but you choose a random subset not of z mod nz for n a prime, but for the vec space over finite fields, then this is not correct. So in fact, in that setting, so if z mod nz is replaced by f2 to the n, um, where 2 to the n is big N, let's say, then almost surely the clique number is bigger than log n times an extra log, log log. And actually, that's also sharp. I mean, up to the constant, it behaves like log n times log log n. So it's sort of a bit sensitive to the group you choose. And somehow, and actually, there's a lot that's still mysterious about this. I have no real clue what happens, for example, in non-abelian groups. So. Let me just. So the solution to your problem there would behave differently for the depending on the field. Right? Yeah. I mean, count yeah. That count. That's a union bound. Yeah. So I'm going to say in a moment what the link between this type of question and uh, the counting sum sets type of question is. But before I do that, let me just say a few words about the um, the quadratic residue graph. So there's a slightly curious feature of the quadratic residue graph, which is that actually it's not quite as good as choosing a random set A. So there's a result of Graham and Ringrose. Um, which tells you that if A is the quadratic residues, mod n, uh, then the clique number of 
that graph, the quadratic residue graph, is bigger than log n times log 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 n for infinitely many n. Um, and you can, you can state and prove a more precise version of this theorem of, of uh, Rob Morris and myself to show that if you, took, if you take a random sequence of graphs, one for each prime, <coughs> then almost surely all of the clique numbers will be bounded by a constant times log n. So somehow these quadratic residue graphs are behaving not quite like random um, graphs. Well, I can, yeah, let me tell you one or two things. Let me, let me explain somehow the reason that quadratic residue graphs behave slightly anomalously in this respect. So the reason is, the reason is that it's possible um, for the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, up to sort of log n, log, log, log n, to all be quadratic residues. Modulo n. And uh, if they are all quadratic residues, then you get a clique of size a half this, just by taking the, the interval of the numbers up to a half log n times log 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 n. So why is that possible? Well, basically, the intuition is that as n varies over primes, the quadratic residue symbols um, at primes, so 2 Legendre n, 3 Legendre n, and so on, up to Q Legendre n, they behave like independent uh, random variables somehow as n ranges over primes. So it's very difficult to prove statements like that. This is basically somehow what the... Um, generalized Riemann hypothesis is telling you one, one application of that. Um, but if you assume that these do behave like independent <coughs> coin tosses, you should expect that they come up heads, all of them come up heads, even if Q is about as big as, well, you can afford to take log n primes and still expect that sometimes they will all come up heads. So this is the log nth prime. And actually, the log nth prime is about log n times log log n, which is even better than what Graham and Ringrose get, but they didn't have the generalized Riemann hypothesis uh, available to them. So if all those coins come up heads, then because of the multiplicativity of the Legendre symbol, in fact, all of the numbers less than q, not just the primes, are quadratic residues. So that's what goes on. However, for a typical value of n, these won't all come up heads, probably you know, half of them will come up heads, and then you don't get anything like this behavior. And although I haven't tried to write anything like this down, what I suspect is that the correct conjectures about the quadratic residue graph come from imagining that <coughs> these are independent coin tosses, and then somehow the rest of the graph behaves like a random um, Cayley graph. In other words, I would conjecture that for almost all n, the clique number of the uh, quadratic residue graph is basically twice log n, twice log to the base 2 of n. So that contradicts, there's some, I don't know if they're really conjectures, but there's some numerical evidence out there, apparently, that the clique numbers of these quadratic residue graphs are less than a random graph. I've seen that written down. I would doubt that. Okay, so, yes, Sean. If you take a sequence of random, if you choose a sequence of random n, would you expect to see similar behavior? So for infinitely many of those, you'd find much larger clique? No. So uh, if, you if you choose a sequence, um, one of sets, one for each prime, yeah. then almost surely the clique number will be bounded by 2 plus little o 1 log to the base 2 of n, for all n. Yeah. There's some barrel cantelli argument you can do. So let me just explain briefly what this problem has got to do with counting uh, some sets. It's quite easy to explain. So uh, what is the expected number? 
So suppose that A is random. A contained in Z mod NZ is picked at random. Uh, what is the expected number of k-cliques in the Cayley graph? graph G A. Well, let's sum over all sets of size. Ah, A is a terrible, that is a terrible piece of notation. S sets of size X. So X is going to be the set of vertices that's supposed to be being a, a K clique. What's the probability that the clique that that set of vertices, which is a set of k elements in Z mod NZ, what's the probability that that spans a clique in the Cayley graph? Well, it's just precisely um, 2 to the power of minus x plus x. It's actually not quite that. You have to take what's called the restricted sum set, which means that you're not interested in um, adding x to x itself, or little x to little x itself. So you can split this up according to the size of x plus x. Um, size of x plus x equals m. And then it's just the number of sets x in z mod nz of size k, <coughs> whose sum set has size m times 2 to the minus m. So you sum this over k and m. So in other words, if you have good bounds for the number of sets with a certain sum set, you get good bounds for the, num the expected number of k cliques in the random Cayley graph. The sum is only over k, just m, not k. Sorry, just, yeah, just m. But, and so you want to show well, basically, you throw into this the best bounds you have for this quantity, obviously. And uh, you hope that you can show that this is little o of 1, with k being as small as possible. So with k being uh, 2 plus epsilon times log to the base 2 of big N. So that's the aim. So actually, the way that the various bounds for this quantity feed back into Calculating the expected number of k cliques is quite complicated. Um, and actually, so the, the result that Rob Morris and I proved is only about when m is small in comparison to k. It turns out one also needs to consider various other ranges of m in terms of k. Uh, but the, the bounds for that were already in my, my earlier paper on, on this subject. So it all feeds into this. I do want to say something about how one goes about counting these sum sets. But just before I do that, I want to want mention one other application. And one reason I want to mention this is that I'm not actually convinced that this is not trivial. Maybe it is trivial. Somebody could come up to me afterwards and say, but can't you just do this? So here's a second application of counting sum sets results. Um, choose a set of natural numbers at random. Let A, B, in the natural numbers, be chosen at random. So what I mean by that is just pick each element to lie in A with probability a half independently. Uh, then the probability that A plus A misses um, K integers is equal to 2 to the minus k over 2 times 1 plus little o of 1. Um, so the sum set of the set A will be an infinite set of density a half. It will almost surely cover all sufficiently large integers. When you, the, the, the sum of it with itself will almost surely cover sufficiently large integers. And the probability that it misses out k of them is exactly this. And it's easy to see that that's sharp. 
up to the little a1, because um, if a misses, a is disjoint from 1 up to k over 2, which does happen with probability 2 to the minus k over 2, uh, then a plus a misses um, 1 up to k. So we, I mean, we have to throw all of our bounds um, at this to get this thing, but I, some, I have a suspicion that this is perhaps not as hard as all that. Who knows? The strange thing. So in the remaining time, I want to say a few things about how you count uh, sets with small subset. So how do we count sets A contained in 1 up to N with um, a fixed size, little k, and with doubling constant at most, big K. So the basic idea is that we count them by isomorphism class. So we count them by isomorphism class. And the notion of isomorphism I'm talking about here is what's called Freiman isomorphism. So two sets of Freiman isomorphic if they have the same additive structure. So a Freiman isomorphism, pi from a set A to a set B, is a Freiman isomorphism uh, if, well, pi of A1, if it preserves additive relations of length 2. So pi of A1 plus pi of A2 is equal to uh, pi of A3 plus pi of A4, if and only if A1 plus A2 equals A3 plus A4. So the idea is that somehow many of the sets A um, with small doubling will be isomorphic to one another. So for example, all arithmetic progressions are isomorphic. Um, So we split the problem into two bits, counting the number of isomorphism classes. So we count the number of isomorphism classes um, but when you've counted the number of isomorphism classes, you need to count the number of embeddings from some chosen set in that isomorphism class back into 1 up to n. And then, for a given set B, uh, the number of isomorphisms pi from B into 1 up to N. So that's the basic strategy for counting. And the two bits have quite different flavors. So there's a very nice result by Ruger, which is used in his proof of Freiman's theorem. Uh, maybe I should have said, so somehow, for anyone who's looked at some additive combinatorics, pr the first strategy that presents itself when you ask how many sets there are with doubling at most k is why not try and apply Freiman's theorem? So Freiman's theorem tells you that A is contained in a, uh, a grid of small dimension. Unfortunately, the containment parameters are necessarily somewhat bad. And so if you apply Freiman's theorem, it will tell you that A is contained in a grid. But most of the sets contained in that same grid and of the same size as A will have doubling 2 to the power k. So it's completely useless, unfortunately. But in the course of the proof of Freiman's theorem, Ruja proved what's called the Ruja's model lemma, which is that every set, every A contained in 1 up to n with size little k and um, 
doubling constant at most big K is from an isomorphic uh, to a subset of Z modulo QZ, where Q is a prime that's really similar size to K. Q is a prime, and um, Q has size at most just a constant times little k. So constant times little k. So you can think of it like this. You've got um, you're interested in sets A inside 1 up to n, which have small doubling. So I don't know whether they look like some grid, perhaps. But by applying one of these Freiman isomorphisms, you can make them a dense subset of um, cyclic. <coughs> so to solve the first problem, how many Freiman isomorphism classes of sets with doubling at most some constant there are, it suffices to solve it inside a cyclic group. For large sets inside a cyclic group. So how do we solve that problem? Here's my cyclic group Z modulo QZ. Well, what we do is prove um, a type of regularity lemma that's it's somewhat related to what's called by some people the arithmetic regularity lemma. And the statement is uh, potentially useful elsewhere. It states that if you take a dense subset of Z mod Q, where Q is a prime, then after dilating the set, the set looks like this. So you can divide up Z mod Q into roughly equal bits. So I've divided it into Q primed bits, Q primed pieces, uh, where Q primed is another prime. And on, well, basically on, on those pieces, on most of those pieces, your set looks highly pseudo-random. So let's, um, let's give this a name. So suppose S is a set in Z mod Q. It looks like this. It's sort of highly, in some of these chunks, so in some of the chunks there will be none of S, and then in some other chunks uh, the set S will be highly pseudo-random looking. Yeah, the pieces are intervals. Um, I won't give the precise statement. It's so what we actually get is um, the, the length of the intervals is at least tends to infinity with Q, and the the regularity statement is that most pairs of intervals have a sort of what we call a sort of a joint regularity property. Um, so when I say highly pseudo-random, uh, what I mean is that when you add the contents of this interval to the contents of this interval, you get essentially all of the contents of the summed intervals. So it means that you have a situation like this. So you have a, some sort of pseudo-random set here, and another pseudo-random set here. And when you add them together, you get pretty much the entire interval of twice the length. Uh, as I said, I haven't stated this regularity lemma precisely, but one thing that's uh, perhaps interesting about it is that it doesn't require tower type bounds. So it's, um, it requires merely double exponential bounds. But it's proven in a similar way to the usual regularity lemmas by a sort of energy incrementation argument. Is there something that's common, or? Mm, I don't know of any thing that's it's directly analogous to. The freeze cannon gives you sort of one. Maybe it is actually quite similar. On some level, maybe it is similar to that. Okay.
OK, so suppose you have such a lemma. So this is somehow a picture of what just a typical dense subset of Z mod Q looks like. How do we use this to count sets? Um, well, if the doubling of S is at, is at most K, so I know that um, I'm assuming that the size of S is K, and its doubling <coughs> is at most big K. But I know what happens when I add this set S to itself. Basically, whenever I have an interval that contains some bit of S, when I add the bit of S in that interval to the bit of S in another interval, I get everything in the sum of those two intervals. So let's let, uh, I don't know, let T be the set of intervals. on which um, S has mass. And then S plus S is pretty much all of T plus T. But T plus T is at least twice the length of T by the Cauchy-Davenport theorem. But T plus T is at least twice the length of T by Cauchy-Davenport. So the Cauchy-Davenport theorem tells you that when you add two sets of residues modulo a prime, um, the size of their sum sets at least basically the size of the two sets. And here, OK, I've not got sets of residues. I've got intervals. But they're indexed by somehow z mod q prime z. So when I add them together, I get the, the set of intervals I get is at least twice the length as what, of what I had before. And so therefore, um, the length of t has got to be at most big K times little k over 2. So the set S, which is supposed to have doubling at most big K, has been selected from a union of intervals of length at most um, big K, little k over 2. And these, I mean, there aren't many unions of intervals. They're extremely sort of blocky type sets. So let's just suppose there's some <coughs> small number of those. And then for each of them, I'm selecting K elements from a set of this size. So this is where I get a bound. So it gives basically big K, little k over 2, choose K choices for S. So that's roughly how we manage to count the number of Freiman isomorphism classes of sets of small doubling. Just to recap. There's something called Rouge's model lemma that says you can always find a Freiman isomorphic copy of your set in a cyclic group. <coughs> Once you're in the cyclic group, every set has this kind of block-like structure by a regularity lemma. And then you can control the number of blocks on which you have to worry about there being any portion of your set by the Cauchy-Davenport theorem. So that's a very rough sketch. There's a whole another part of the argument, which is once I've got a Freiman isomorphic copy of A, I have to figure out how many embeddings there are back into 1 up to n. I shan't say anything about that other than that it's the number of such isomorphisms is very closely linked to what's called the Freiman dimension of the set. And there's some geometric arguments of Freiman that let you bound that. In fact, the Freiman dimension of a set of doubling k is actually bounded by k. So, OK, I think I'm out of time. Yeah, so I did not think about that. I mean, that has to do with looking at these things in quite sparse settings, right? So you're, you're not going to be choosing a random set A. You, you choose a random set A with probability P, where P is pretty small. Um, actually, Nogger Alon has a, a very general question, which is to show that if you choose, so if you're just in a group G of size n, and if you choose a random set of size t, then he conjectures that the clique number should be, or the independence number should be basically n over t um, times a log factor. And I thought briefly about this, but it, it's quite a lot more difficult than these things. It it's going to require some more subtle estimates for these um, 
but counting the number of sets with a specified sum set, but for quite a lot bigger values of k, and you're going to need some quite precise things, it, se it seems to me. So that seems quite difficult. So the, the m to the k factor comes from just counting the number of uh, m, m values? Yeah, okay. yeah. For this random subsets of integers, if you pick them with some other probability, one third or something like that, do you get, again, the missing part? Yeah, we, we left that open in our paper. I mean, yes, you'd get an answer for that. So if you, if you choose if you choose a set of natural numbers at random by picking each element to line the set with probability of third, then you could calculate the probability that it misses out k elements um, asymptotically or something. Uh, is it always missing the first? Property? I think so for fixed values of p. We didn't really bother to look at it. Uh, the question would become quite a lot more subtle if you started pushing p to be, I guess there's some thresholds known for when a random set of integers is even a basis. So if you choose p to be like 1 over n to the 1 half, so you include n to be in your set with probability like 1 over n to the 1 half or something, or a little bit more than that, and then almost surely it's a basis. I think it would be pretty difficult to figure out the probability that it omits k elements in that regime. But for constant p, there would be no problem. Maybe still sticking with p equals a half, but going to other cones, let's say the first quadrant of the integers or something. Yeah. Um, I would guess that exactly the same techniques work because every subset of R to the D, in fact, is Freiburg isomorphic to a subset of Z. So you've basically counted the same thing here, but you'd have to be a, a little bit more careful about The number should probably be different. Um, I'm not even... Yes, it probably should be K over 4 or something if you're in two dimensions. Our methods would give an answer to that. I haven't thought about what it would be. Yeah. Is it the discrepancy between what happens with the quadratic residue graphs and the random Kelly graphs is that the product of uh, quadratic residues is a quadratic residue? Yeah. So do you think it would be interesting to look at probabilistic models to generate Z A with this closure property and then? Yeah, so it's some. Um, so I suspect the correct probabilistic model of the quadratic residues, is that it behaves like a random plus or minus one multiplicative function um, on somehow. Yeah, I, so, I mean, I guess the point is the quadratic residue symbol is multiplicative. So somehow the way to model it would be its values on the first few primes are independently plus or minus one. And then after that, it just behaves like a completely random plus or minus one function. So it's sort of got a little bit of multiplicativity at the start. I would guess, but I haven't worked out, that if you take that model for it, you conclude that somehow a random function in that class has the graph has a cleat number twice log 2n. It's sort of, it, analyzing random multiplicative functions <coughs> is not that easy, but it is sort of doable. Thanks.